All right, well, we're being joined here at TAM 13 <laughs> by Dr. Dean Adele. Dean, welcome to the Skeptics Guide. Oh, my absolute pleasure. Right, welcome Thank back. You. Um, so we had you on our show a couple years ago, but this is the first time we're actually meeting in person. That's right. Uh, so, Absolutely. Yeah. You look different than on the radio. I look different. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm taller on the radio. <laughs> Not as gray. Uh, more, more svelte. Yeah. <laughs> All right, but, 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 spe but speaking of radio, I have to get this in because this has been actually, for me personally, 34 years in the making. So I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going to hijack this. You look 28, so how about that? Thank you very much. I, pre I appreciate that. You're supposed um, to return that kind of thing. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you look like my son. Um, <laughs> that? Um, look, I've been uh, listening, obviously, to you on the radio since the 1980s. Um, as far as I'm concerned, you are the trailblazer, and were it not for all the work that you have done, I'm not sure that any of us would be here podcasting right now, and I think our younger audience doesn't have a real appreciation for the work and the trailblazing that you did. You were doing science-based medicine, frankly, before even anyone knew what science-based medicine was, and you That's were doing fantastic. it to a massive audience before there was, you know, obviously any podcasting or, or any or anything else. Like you had said in your talk today, um, you were the first uh, syndicated radio talk show across the country, and I just think that's absolutely fascinating, and because I've been listening to you since I was a boy, it's just a tremendous honor to actually have you here and on our show. Well, thank you so much. I, <clears throat> I do really appreciate it. I've not let a lot of those kinds of things in, because you know what this <laughs> business is like. It's been very, very intense, and I just did what I did. I didn't, we were talking, didn't even feel worthy to be here to give a talk. I mean, there's experts here who know more than I do about everything. No, but I think you saw by the uh, audience reaction that you know yes. you, are, you are speaking to the home crowd and they very much appreciate uh, the work that you've done. Well, that's very, very kind. You sort of make a grown man cry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we can move on to the harder questions. Yeah, but, but that's, that cut me to shreds. Yeah. Yeah. No, but that, the, the, I was surprised here. You were, I knew that, obviously, that you were a trailblazer. I actually didn't know until you said it on stage that you were the first syndicated talk show. Yes. Radio. That's amazing. That's of right. any kind of, I mean, not there just were medical, networks yeah. then. There was Larry King on the mutual network, but syndication uh, was a struggle. A lot of people tried it. Uh, as you know, it's become successful. And ABC took the first attempt at it with Talk Radio Network, and they had about 65 markets. They, all the talent was in uh, LA, and they, um, and I got, I hopped on board that after doing a local yeah. show, but they didn't like the idea of paying for satellite costs out of San Francisco. And I got a yeah. call one day and say, I got good news and bad news. And I said, all right, lay it on. He says, bad news is you're going to be fired tomorrow. The good news is, and this is the president of the company talking to me, he says, I'm quitting my job and you and I are going to go into business together. We're going to show them how it's done. And that was a guy named wow. Ed McLaughlin, who was yeah. the head of ABC's talk That's radio awesome. deal. And the guy went on <clears throat> to do Rush, uh, Rush Limbaugh. Mm -hmm. Sure. So he... Uh, he, uh, he did it. He really, yeah, yeah. Uh, he really did it, and then it all kind of followed after. And in after case that. anyone in the audience doesn't know what syndication means, yes. can yeah. you give us a technical description? Yeah, syndication means you go out there and you sell that show to individual stations, whether they're CBS or ABC or Fox or whatever. Um, it's not coming as a network where it's yeah. forced upon the station. Right. So you have to sell it. So when you go into a market, the way it usually works is you give the show for free to the local station. You take back three of the advertising spots, and they get to sell the rest. Mm -hmm. And if it's uh, popular, it works. Um, it works for them. So it really, of course, <laughs> this is health. So it's universal. Mm -hmm. Where the bias against syndicating talk radio was, it's got to be local, 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 local issues. Yeah. Uh, but that turned out not to be true. And mm -hmm. uh, you know, Rush and others tapped into something nobody really thought was there. I remember listening to his tape, and I says, "Are you kidding me? No one's going to listen to this." <laughs> okay, so <laughs> you can be wrong once in a while. <laughs> Dean, at what point did your your audience get to a size where you were like, "What is happening here?" Mm. To the size, you mean? Yeah, like when you found out, like at one point you heard a stat and you're like, well, we're blowing up. Yeah, yeah. Right? yeah. Like when was that and when did that feel you like? You know, it's very funny because, you know, like what you do here, it's in a way, um, it's lonely. Mm -hmm. You're not talking to real people like you just were. And I'm sure it's a different a different feeling. It oh, is yeah. for oh, me. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, and looking at an, an engineer who's sitting near board reading a newspaper, you know, and maybe someone who's uh, handling the calls, uh, the calls for you. And it never really hit me until one day, I said something funny on the air. I don't know what it was. And I thought to myself, wow, if you look at the, I mean, we were up to eight million listeners a week at one point, and saying. Can yeah. you imagine the sound of a few million people laughing? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I, I mean, that would be like 10 candlestick parks of people <laughs> laughing. Yeah. And then all of a sudden it dawned on me, 
And then it was a little frightening yep. because yeah. you let that in, and all of a sudden you're getting, you know, I remember one, one time doing a CPR program at Candlestick Park, one of 50, 60,000 people, and I said, this is not 50,000 people. This is just like a radio studio. Just calm down. Look at the grass. Yeah. <laughs> Take the microphone yeah. and, don't, and don't really let it in. Um, so it was that moment when I, I, I kind of realized it, and, I, and, I, and maybe that made me feel isolated. I, I, I have to say that um, I, I think I'm a shy person. I'm, I'm easygoing mm -hmm. and I'm social and all that, but basically the whole rest of the game makes you uncomfortable. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. I can stand in front of a television audience and a radio program and all that and do those kinds of things. But even speaking here, you know, it was funny. I was thinking to myself going on, you know, this may be your last public appearance. Um, and feeling a little bit of the heartbeat, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. it's kind of fun, you know, yeah. you get mm -hmm. the problem I mean, yeah, for you guys are, you're so relaxed, you just <laughs> naturally, you know each other, you know, this is just a conversation. Yeah, you, that's don't, right. you don't even think about the people out there that might be hearing it, which is where you want to be, but right. sometimes right. you can get so relaxed, you know, you, yeah. let down, <laughs> you let down your guard and it's like, okay, <laughs> what do we do next, honey? <laughs> <laughs> we have the benefit in that, you know, we pre-record, we're not always, you know, broadcast live, it's very rare that we ever have done that. Um, so we, there are certain advantages built into that, whereas your medium, mm -hmm. you know, what you say goes out. Yeah, so, I know. Know, taking things back. Do you ever, you, you don't edit your stuff, do you? Yeah, we do. Uh, you know, yeah, yeah. For time, is that, that important? Well, for, for time and content. Or if he says something stupid, you It's a lot. Go. So we, the, the, the <laughs> podcasting, you know, uh, standard, I think, is they're very edited. Because the part of it is, I want to pack as much content as possible yes, good. into the time, and so if there's a, if there's like a thirty seconds where I'm like I might be editing, I'm like there was no new information in that new, that thirty seconds. So I'm just gonna cut that out, and that allows me to keep more meaty content in the show, or um, you know whatever. Like the, the, was that joke funny enough to keep in? You know, I can <laughs> right, make that right. make those kind of editorial decisions. Sure. And also, I want these guys to be relaxed, and so I I, I don't want them to be editing themselves too much. Yeah. And so they say things that are maybe close to the line of yeah. what I think is acceptable for the show, and I have to decide if I think am I going to keep it, or am I going to let okay. it through. So I'm editing for sure, like, sure, for sure. a lot on a lot of levels at the same time. Um, well, we take more risks during the recording. So that means, means we can take That's more risks. We could take yeah. a lot of risks because if it doesn't work out, who cares? I edited it out. And sure. on a live show, you have to be so careful. When you first started, did you have? Was there a delay built in? Uh, there was usually a delay. Mm -hmm. You have to learn to not count on that, but uh, it's with the audience. Yeah. People will call up and say the darn stuff. Yeah, so sure. it's up to you get a good call screener, yeah. which you have to have. You get people who are drunk, people... Listen, oh, God. Um, you know, okay. Talk radio is a very, uh, you know, the, un, the untold story is that it's very ageist in that they don't mm -hmm. like older people. And you're doing a show on health, mm -hmm. you're going to attract a lot of older people. The advertiser wants 25, 54. Yeah. So um, I uh, always thought someday someone's going to catch on to this and they're going to pose people to call the show with um, a different voice, same question, and an older sounding voice, same question, and see how older people are cut out, mm -hmm. of, the, cut out of the equation. So we really fought that very, very hard. And it was, it was difficult because a lot of our clients, a lot of stations around the country, you know, talk radio station in Texas is struggling, you know, to get their ratings. And I don't want a bunch of old people crabbing about this or that, <laughs> so forth and so on. So the challenge was to keep it entertaining, sounding mm -hmm. young, but you know, not uh, being biased like that. And so a good call screener is, yeah. cr is, is critical in a live, um, you know, commercial uh, talk Absolutely. show. And that's the person that like will talk to the people as they call in and then do like a super fast interview, right? Like yeah, they are. I tell you, some of them, the best ones I've ever had, to go. Hello, we're not talking about that today. <laughs> Hello, we're not talking about that today. <laughs> okay, hang on. I mean, that fast. Wow. Yeah. wow. Because the more you scream, the better quality calls you're going to yeah. get. Wow. And we wanted to have, because, you know, I can't talk about aching backs all the time. Uh, we like to mix in, talk about issues mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. things maybe have pissed people off about. Um, I can say that, right? Yeah, you can say pissed off. <laughs> yeah, fuck yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and things like that. So... There are a lot of components um, 
a lot of components to yeah. it, to keeping it. And of course, you got to, that 15 minutes, you got to keep people through the breaks. And then mm. we started doing things like, you know, you've learned to develop the quiz into something mm -hmm. keeps people using. Great. Yeah. That was great. You had me riveted. <laughs> um, I'm clapping. I'm clapping. <laughs> um, so we do things to keep people across the advertising yeah. break. And, and then advertising. Oh, my gosh. Sometimes you get horrible ads, and that bores the hell out of people. Yeah. Anyway, a lot of factors going into the front right. lines of, um, uh, front lines of that. Then plus the politics and the religion sure. and the idiocy. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm on in San Francisco, but I'm also on in Texas and Alabama yeah. and all these places. And, um, you know, learning how to navigate, uh, navigate that. I think I found that the subject of health, people, you know, were more self-interested mm -hmm. in their health that they would, you know, lay down their arms, so to speak, to deal, uh, to deal with me, uh, unless I went over the, you know, crossed the line. Mm -hmm. And I just had to. I just had to be honest. And you start talking about, you know, as I mentioned in the talk, so many religious issues um, were important national issues. You couldn't talk about health care without talking about mm -hmm. politics mm -hmm. uh, and people's religion influences that. And I remember one day um, saying to a guy, it was my fetal, during the fetal cell debate, mm -hmm. and I remember putting the question out in frustration saying, okay, here's the question. Your daughter is dying of a disease. I'm holding a tube. It's a cure. It will cure her. She's going to be dead in two months. And she's dying. And here is the cure. And it was derived from fetal cells. No, the fetus wasn't killed for it. This would have been, quote, garbage. Sometimes you get gross to get people's attention. It was going to be thrown out in the lab or, you know, in some fertility center. Would you allow her? Well, 10 out of 10 people calling said, no, I wouldn't give it to her. Wow. And I said to myself, wow. They are lying. <laughs> yeah, what, do you, what do you think? Can people feel yeah. that strongly about these mm -hmm. principles? That they're so confused, yeah. you know, wow. thinking that you're out there killing babies to get these yeah. cells. And, yeah. um, so it was a constant learning experience to stay alive. And when I'd get threatened, you know, I remember a call from, it happened to be a station in Texas who called our friend, you know, we know at Premier, you know, I said, mm -hmm. okay, I'm, we're taking it off the air. He just mentioned something about blah, blah, blah. And I said, you know, live and die by the sword. But you, uh, there are times when you have to make that choice. And there are also always other stations in town. Mm -hmm. If it's a town or market large enough that there's more than one talk radio station. Yeah. So you can say, that's fine. Drop our show. You'll see us across the street. They've been wanting their mm -hmm. show for a long time. So it's a, a chess game. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. Say, this is like this is so beautiful. You, know, you just do a good job and word of mouth, and it grows. And, you know. so are, are there any callers that snuck through screening that you remember that are just oh, amazing? Oh, there were people who could fool us. Yeah. Oh yes, please. And my call screeners, they were the best. And there was a guy who, I mean, he'd just call and lead us down the primrose path, and he knew how to fake symptoms and describe something, and then turn it into into the joke, and we'd all feel really, really stupid. But then my call screeners would recognize his voice, and uh, there wasn't actually not a lot of that, uh, but if you knew how to play the game, mm -hmm. you know, you can get on a talk show. You, yeah. you, you got to know how to sound and what to say, and that's what's treacherous, because if, for instance, if you wanted to get on Suppose there's some right wing radio show and you want to, you know, get through the, you want to get on the air and they're not going to let you on if you're honest who you are. You say something that you know they want to hear mm -hmm. and get on the air and say, you idiot, da 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 da, da and then do your shtick. Um, not a lot of that. I didn't really have, yeah, have yeah. a lot of that. I think I had good call screening and plus, um, You'd have to be pretty good to get bias because uh, you're talking about health. You're talking about yeah. perspectives on things that we would deal with. It's often drifted away from health. You can't you can't help that. Right. You can't, right, right, can't right. help that. And you were also, I think, uh, a trailblazer, if you will, in addressing the scientific issues of medicine. You weren't just talking about health, which anyone could talk about sure, health sure. on TV or radio, but like actually defending good science in medicine. How how. Did that something that, like, from the day one, you're like, I'm going to be science-based, or did you just fall into that because you realized you no, had to? No, it evolved. It evolved. It evolved yeah. with my own education. Yeah. You know, when I, I still have the very, very first show I did on that country music station back in Sacramento on that fateful day it all happened, and you probably wouldn't recognize me. I was a hippie, you know. <laughs> and um, mm -hmm. yet I, I was starting to come back down to earth at that particular uh, point. But I, uh, little when I just, just, 
got rabid about medical journals and started reading again, it just slowly came to me rather, rather quickly. And I, I, I realized that that was more interesting. Mm -hmm. I mean, I saw through, you know, pseudoscience pretty quickly. I mean, mm -hmm. I knew there was nothing here. It was wishful thinking. I mean, there's a reason that I, I don't really have a full grasp on. I love discussing it. You know, why, what is the lure? Uh, and I can go back to the 60s and the early days. There was something that was, you know, those big bad scientist guys. It was overthrowing the corporate world. Yeah. There was a war. You know what the era was like. Just anti-establishment. Anti-establishment. Yeah, yeah. And all of a sudden, you know, I, I started thinking, eh, it's not really so simple, is it? Um, and it was nice to think, oh, how wonderful that, you know, we can you know, stop a war and we can stop certain things, you know, certain corporate practices and certain aspects of the world at that point um, by magical thinking is really <laughs> what it was. And while that movement took off and is what we deal with today, you know, mm -hmm. what people call, I don't know, new age and magical thinking didn't exist then. That was just the temper of the times. And everybody rejected, you know, science and medicine and uh, people went off on their own. I saw horrible things. I had friends who were physicians who went off into alternative medicine, and they were dangerous. They did mm -hmm. bad, bad things. Mm -hmm. And it was early and experimental, and nobody understood uh, the boundaries. So uh, I didn't ever open the practice of mm -hmm. alternative medicine. I had friends that did. I, it just wasn't... Uh, this is, but when are we talking about? Like in the, seven, in the early late 70s? Late 70s. Yeah. No, early 70s. Early, early 70s. 70s. My, see, my... Uh, I have, have a son who's now, of course, in his 40s, born in 72, born in that bus, actually, that I had. And uh, <laughs> I, did, I did that at home. Oh, my God. That was an epiphany, let me tell you. Uh, I'm an ophthalmologist. Mm -hmm. I mean, I did the obstetrical training like you did yeah. in school, and I'm delivering this baby in my bedroom. <laughs> and all of a sudden, I go, what the, what am I doing here? <laughs> this is crazy. Yep. And yet everybody was doing it, you yeah. know, and he's fine and it's great and all that. But I yeah. started realizing that, you know, this was not going to be <laughs> not awesome. going to be good. Yeah, no, medicine could stand a little nudging, yeah, and a sure, little sure. thoughtfulness about about people and not being and learning to communicate yeah. and being a, a little less dogmatic about stuff and allowing that was the era when you were supposed to be a partner in your health care, and uh, which is still a difficult, I you know, concept and. Uh, but there were little things like that that, you know, I think straightened me, straightened me out. But I never mm -hmm. forgot the roots. And I think it helped me communicate with people, mm -hmm. you know, because of that. When people call about vaccines, I was very sympathetic to what it must be like to somebody who's not medically trained. I mean, I realized, you know, at one point midstream, I really, you know, got into the grateful thing that uh, I'm so lucky to have had a good education. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, what a blessing. I just took it for granted. And that made me a little more dogmatic than I needed to be. But when I realized about that, I got sympathetic to people who don't really understand these things. And a movie star, I mean, we've had some great talks about, you know, celebrity and what it means to mm -hmm. a lot of people. Oh, they're a celebrity, therefore they must know about that. Right. <laughs> yeah. You know, so uh, to say to them, I get why you're confused. I, I, I understand yeah. it. But and then transfer the discussion to, yeah, yeah. Uh, to helping them make a, make a decision. At some point, some, somebody in an advertising company said, let's have an actor that plays a doctor on TV mm -hmm. play a doctor on a commercial and actually say, I'm not a doctor, but I play one on TV as if that means anything. Yeah, because yeah, it I, does. It, yeah. For some reason, it does I to the people a, watching. Yes, I have a T-shirt home. I don't know. I mean, I remember that when that came, when that campaign, you know, happened. I have a T-shirt at home. that said, "I'm not a real doctor, but I play one on the TV." <laughs> I never wore it because, of, wow, that's me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, in a way. And I have met, you know, through the course of my career, uh, people who play doctors on soap operas and on the med all mm -hmm. the medical soap operas. And I've had more than one of them come up to me and say, you know, it's ridiculous. I go to parties. People come up to me and start asking me medical questions. You know, like I think I'm a really, yeah. I'm a real neurosurgeon. They come up and talk to me about the headaches when they play a neurosurgeon. And how know? dangerous if that person actually started trying to like disseminate yeah, yeah, yeah. advice. Yeah, I exactly. think it's so important that you made that distinction early on because I think in the skeptic community, sometimes you see people who don't make the distinction between a good, hardworking mother of three who has a child with autism who just wants answers yeah, exactly. and somebody who is 
an intentional charlatan who's spreading misinformation in order to profit from that. And you obviously are going to approach those two different people very differently. Exactly. I'm so happy to hear you bring that up because I, early in my career, I, I, I had to separate out the intentional charlatans who are criminals. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's somebody who's putting a bullet, you know, in your belly. Um, to people who really believe and think they're really helping. And I, I had a confrontation once in the airport. I, I alluded to it briefly of a woman who had an autistic child. And, you know, my airport confrontation with the uh, woman with the breast implants and Louis Vuitton luggage, that was okay. I didn't have any bad feelings about <laughs> calling her out. But <laughs> here's this mother, you know, and you could just feel it. And it's, you know, people tend to want to blame when something like that happens to them. It's just hard to accept the randomness of the universe in our lives. And so we'll blame the obstetrician or the mm -hmm. pediatrician or always find somebody, you know, to blame. And this was kind of an easy one with the support of, you know, Hollywood. And this poor woman, and my, my wife would sit here and tell you, she just was yelling and screaming at me. And I, you know, I just let her. Yeah. I just let her. I didn't have the heart to argue back. There was no point in it. Um, I don't know where she is today and what she thinks and feels, but on the air when it would come up, I say, you know, if we could spend half, you know, a tenth of the time working towards helping these kids and funding research to help these kids instead of this debate, which is a non-debate, um, the science has spoken, and yet uh, the problem is how people like Jim Carrey and, you know, uh, what's his ex-girlfriend? Um, Jim McCarthy. You know, boy, there's a piece of work. <laughs> oh, yeah. You know, mm -hmm. how they can grab an audience, huge audience, and one word from them, and the rest of us spend years trying to undo yeah. that. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. That's why we're here. That's why you're here, mm -hmm. and that's what really feels good, I yeah. gotta tell you. And I see the enthusiasm and the passion that everybody here at this meeting, let's just make it all inclusive, you know, bring to the subject, I, I feel optimistic. I didn't always, and sometimes it's felt, oh my God, this is not making a difference. This is, this, things, are getting, things are getting worse, and uh, my wife taught it, taught it Cal in environmental sciences, and as she sits and watches this global warming debate, it really frustrates her. Uh, and yet, you know, I usually advise people that these kinds of things, they're not straight line graphs. It's yeah. like the stock market. It's up, down, it's up, down. Mm -hmm. It's the general trend. Right. And when I think where we brought that the vaccine debate to, you mm -hmm. know, where now all of a sudden more people, they get it. Mm -hmm. I realize, you know, okay, there were down moments, but that's, that's what it takes to not, not give up. No, absolutely. No, there have definitely been victories, you know, no. concrete. You know, they're always, you know, incremental, you know, maybe short term, but everything is short term. But yeah, the, 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 as we say all the time, there's no ultimate victory when it right. comes to this sort of thing. It's just, you know, somebody's got to be the persistent voice of reason. And even if things are getting worse, they would probably be worse still if it weren't for, you know, you know people like you were out, who were out there saying, no, you know, I think the, the, what the, your strength uh, as a radio host was, was that um, you were not uh, someone who like was bashing alternative medicine or who's defending a particular position. You were just medical authority, just sort of a generic medical authority, who was saying, "Yeah, you know, was hap happened to support science-based medicine, you know, and 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 target unscientific medicine." I think that gives it a lot of power. Yes, I I, 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 I hear I hear what you're saying, and I think. I mean, I, I still go back and try to analyze and yeah. reanalyze, yeah. you know, what was I? What did I do? What was that, what yeah. was that whole thing all about? Because, you know, uh, there were no guidelines. You right. just, you go with your gut, so to speak, mm -hmm. uh, at, at times like that. And, you know, the idea, I mean, I realized at the very, you know, towards the end, uh, as I alluded to, when someone would call up with a headache or a backache and, you know, I, I would say the truth to them, I guess I would rather you do some, you know, placebo thing mm -hmm. than just start gobbling Oxycontin mm -hmm. for, your, for your problem. That's kind of a no-brainer. Um, but don't be fooled. And that's the hard part. Am, yes. I, am I harming a patient by saying, you know, if you go for this, but I was happy to hear in the, the discussion of placebos that maybe it was not so harmful to say, you know, that uh, pick something, homeopathy or acupuncture is mostly a placebo, they still get the effect. So I felt I was least honest in saying, you know, I'm not lying to you, but um, if it helps you 
uh, no harm done as long as you're dealing with your physician who's overseeing this. Where, where I used to get in a lot of trouble with acupuncture is in California. You know, licensed acupuncturist is a separate individual. You got a headache, you can walk into their office and they'll treat you. Mm -hmm. You don't know if that headache, you know, is a tumor yeah. or mm -hmm. whatever the heck is going on. Well, that's why it's the slippery slope. That's why the danger exactly. is. Exactly, tricky area. If you're treating pain, which to me is the only acceptable way of placebo, because pain. Well, subjective symptoms. Subjective symptoms. Pain, exactly. nausea, depression. Yeah. There are some things where there is. You're just asking people how they feel. You're not measuring an objective biological marker. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the, it's the subjective stuff that has a quote-unquote placebo effect, but that's probably because it's subjective. Yeah. Um, but it is tricky. It's, that's like the most tricky thing that we deal with as advocates of science-based medicine is what about the treatment that's inert but people feel better because they're using it. Right. And what is that? What's the problem with that? It's like, well, it's actually fraught with issues. Right. As you say, you know, it's like, are they doing it instead of real medicine? Is it convincing them that magic works, and then they're going to use it when they're really sick? No. You know, is there deception involved? Their wallet for oh, sure. It? Yeah. yeah. Are they that's being really taken cool. advantage of? Right. Good point. Yeah. yeah. That's that's important. That just irks me at times when people will spend their last pennies on, on something and. I think what you kind of danced around there was something that, you know, I was so happy to see data to support that as a physician, you can bring this about by how you approach a patient yeah. and being, you know, positive. And I'll tell you something, I, I just got a doctor recently, first time in my life I've had a primary care <laughs> wow. <laughs> I don't know how that happened. You know, I know how doctors think and I, I do the foolish thing by trying to be my own doctor, which is really stupid, but I'm only, you know, coming to terms with the power of, of the power that we have over people. And, you know, I, I slipped a disc in my back and when this guy walked in the room, it's like I became a layman immediately. Mm -hmm. Immediately, and at first it wasn't comfortable. I don't like being a layman. Yeah. You know, I don't mm -hmm. like giving up all that power. Yeah, and just trying to read between the lines and watching his face, and is he telling me the truth, and does he just want to get, you know, get me on the table, and blah blah blah. And it was uh, very enlightening. And there are programs I know in medical schools around the country where they take medical students and stick them in a hospital room overnight, you know, let them <laughs> see what it's like. Let them understand it from the patient's perspective, which was nothing I was ever taught. You know, I come from the pedestal era, mm -hmm, you know, yeah. and doctor says and doctor doesn't. Uh, and actually, this guy said something, uh, this is a little aside, but not. He was a neurosurgeon. Now, we look way up in the boonies. Mm -hmm. We are hermits. Uh, you know, we are hours from the town of 100 people and nearest neighbors miles away. So for medical, us medical here is tricky. So this guy... I think just to drive his new Porsche, he would come out of UC, <laughs> UC San, San Francisco and would come up and took out a space once a week in some local practitioner's office and seek him up once a week and gather some things. So he said, you know, it's very interesting. I like coming up here to the country because in San Francisco, everything I say, uh, people question. They don't follow my orders. They don't believe what I say. They, they, you know, compliance is horrible. And when I come up here, you country folk, that's me, country <laughs> folk, um, you people do what I, do what I say. I just, not country folk. It, yeah. You can go. You don't there, know who you're talking. You're not dealing with country <laughs> yeah. folk right now, dude. <laughs> uh -huh. And that you know, attitudes about doctors are very, very different. Now, I don't mm -hmm. know who suffers more. I mean, I, mm -hmm. there have been studies that people are more in tune with their bodies. You know, that they have more symptomatology. You know, yeah. it's like this whole thing we taught people. You know, get in touch with your body. Be a partner in your care. Um, that can be that can undermine your. It's care. a double edged sword. It's a double edged sword. There's a very fine line between being knowledgeable about your care and kibitzing your care. Yeah, yeah. You as you know, you know, sure. as a physician we learn to deal with that with that line. And compliance, generally speaking, associated with better outcomes. Sure. You know, so if you're so skeptical of the system and your physician that you're non compliant, that's you know, may not be a good thing. Maybe, exactly. maybe you need a new physician. It'd be dangerous. But yeah. It'd be totally dangerous. I, I I mean I'm so particular about my doctor. And I'll drop him in a heartbeat if I felt like he was anything but offering me the best and he had my best intentions, intentions in mind. I love my primary care physician because I know this guy like studies. You know, I know that he cares that much. So see, I was going to I was going to see if you're going to go there. That's important because surveys of people about their doctors show the most important thing to them. And at least the last survey I saw was he talks to me, he talks to me about mm. things other than my health. So he asks about how the cat is, how the oh my roses God. are. Oh, wow. And 
down on the list was, I think he knows a lot about my disease. Yeah, he was. That's Jeez. frightening. Well, it's frightening how many people have a diagnosis and take medication and can't name what the diagnosis is and can't tell you the name of the medication Absolutely. that's in their handbag. But I have to say, I think it's actually, in some ways, you were talking about a double-edged sword, uh, both good and bad, when you talk about individuals who are maybe too skeptical mm. of their physician, it's bad at an individual level, but I think it shows that there's been a global movement yeah. of education. The fact that people are not trustful, a certain sect of people, but don't trust vaccines, shows that we're in a position in our country where vaccines work. Yes. You know what I mean? That we accepted vaccines so long ago that nobody's having babies and being worried about polio, mm -hmm. so they don't see the symptoms in front of them. So now they have the luxury yeah. of being able to say, my kid's not going to get that polio. Yeah. I don't need to yeah. think and about that. And their kid that. won't get polio for a long time mm -hmm. because the, the herd immunity and it's, you know. And that's the, both the danger, but also I think the beauty of how well the medical establishment has worked historically. Yeah. And that's what we have to not forget. Yes. And no, I think people a, my age tend to forget no, that. I, 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 it's so funny. You've, I, I've said those exact things many, many times, that luxury. And I often, and not too long ago, there were 600 children, you know, 600,000 children a year dying from measles in the world. And I would say, you know, you go to Africa and tell a mom there who just lost her baby that we are spoiled. I've never seen a case of whooping cough. Yeah. I remember polio as a, as a kid. These are some diseases that have almost been wiped off the face yeah. of the earth. And so we're the beneficiaries yeah. of that. So We're lousy with healthy people in the United States. Yeah, and people exactly. in Africa would die for those vaccines. Oh, my God. Oh, really? a fraction of them. Exactly. That's why I think the Disney measles outbreak had such an effect. Sure and I have to say, we predicted that as a, I mean, we, the science-based medicine community, we've mm. been saying for years, it's going to take an outbreak. And then that when that happens, you know, diseases, diseases coming back, then that will shift the political thinking? opinion. Yeah, right. There was the a shift. That's why I was a shift. always love the guilt thing. And I say, well, listen, ma'am, just imagine, just let's go there with me. You know, your child gets one of these diseases and dies because you didn't vaccinate that child. How are you going to feel? Now, more important, suppose your child communicated to another child who was vaccinated because some vaccines are not 100 percent. Or um, a effective. child who has leukemia and can't get vaccinated. Exactly. Right? Yeah. Exactly. Um, and that that often can get people uh, people people thinking about it. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, you, as you say, which is disappointing, but we we know which the reality is that it's the emotional arguments that are effective, not the intellectual arguments. Yes. Mm -hmm. Very important. Oh, I, I, it's just I so disheartening, that. but it's the truth. It isn't, and we are emotional creatures, yeah. and that's the part we can't, you know, we can't forget when it comes to communications. It's important to realize that it's not about simple data. It's about the, it's about the stories and the people, because that's how the other side has made these inroads. You know, when Oprah puts a kid with autism mm -hmm. on, unopposed, etc. Oh my God! Imagine how, you know, how you look challenging mm -hmm. that. Here's this mm -hmm. poor mother. This tragedy, etc. So you have to be very sensitive when you step into that. Dr. Mm -hmm. Dean, you have this calm, cool, sexy radio voice. <laughs> Seriously, I know you'll never, you would never say this about yourself, so let no. me pay you the compliment. Yeah. You, you delivered a, a rational thought with a very emotional touch. You have a soothing voice. You have a voice that people, right, Evan? Absolutely. We've talked about oh, really? it. Without, without, Come without on. a doubt. And with consistency as well, because over the years, obviously, that I've been listening to you and our, our former host who's passed away, Perry DeAngelis, uh, also was a, was a yeah. avid listener of yours as well. He would say the exact same things, that your consistency in all of this and your cool, calm demeanor meant so much yeah. to so many people. It helped. It, it, it helped. You, you have this ultimate fairness about you. Mm -hmm. Like just when you said, hey, well, all right, let's talk about it. I'm like, yeah, let's talk. It's funny. I don't I think mean, of myself. You're that successful way. for a reason. I don't think that was an act. It's good. The yeah. humility is a part of yeah. what makes you you. But I, we well, all so appreciate. It's not an act. I yeah, mean, that's the great genuine. thing. That's why you don't realize it's happening because it's just you. Yeah. It's who you are. Oh, that's yeah. very very kind. I mean, I uh, this fell in my lap. You know, when I think of someone like. Um, um, you know, a guy whose <clears throat> last name is the same as that place at the end of the Yellow Brick Road. Yeah. Um, uh -huh. I don't understand him. I've talked to him. I, I actually, at one point, foolishly gave him my blessing, you know, and he, you know, he wanted was to talk fault. about this. And it was. <laughs> <laughs> he who shall not be named. I think I, I think have the answer. He, he it's very simple. A lot of people, you know? It, it yeah. really, I think, with him revolved around 
you know, the fame and the money. Mm -hmm. But you're very smart. It just struck I, I, I've come to that conclusion. Yeah. He wanted, he went up to my producers twice on two occasions, and both of them, I mean, I, I have trouble even saying this, it sounds so self-aggrandizing, but he said to them, you know, I, I want to be Dean. I want to do what he does before, before he became, you know, the oh Oprah clone. And I realized, wow, I never thought of wanting to be in show business. Yeah. <laughs> that wasn't the last thing in my mind. It just, it kind of happened, which mm -hmm. I guess maybe uh, kept me sane. Yeah. So, Dr. Dean, thanks for joining us again on the show. We loved your talk. Again, thanks for your trailblazing career. Uh, we really appreciate it. That's very, very kind of you, and the best to you guys. You're tracing the next trail. Uh, thank you so much. <laughs> thanks. Thanks, Dr.